and we are now recording. Um, so clean slate legislation, um, you might be familiar with it um, because you came to this uh, town hall today or you might not know anything about it and be ready to um, learn more, but we're gonna start off um, and just watch a short video um, that was put together uh, with some of our advocates on the campaign. My name is Dan Hannikin, and I'm the executive director of Into Action. My name is Patty. I'm a social worker with the city of St. Louis and a grandmother of five grandchildren. My name is Fran Marion. I am a manager at Taco Bell here in Kansas City, Missouri. I am a mother of two. And I'm living with a felony record. And I've been living with a criminal record, living with a record. I got my record trying to cash a stolen check. It was a $700 check to be exact. I started using drugs when I was about 13 years old. I had to be able to feed my addiction and I would shoplift to do that. And that sent me to prison for my first time in 1984. I went to prison for the first time when I was 26 years old. I spent three and a half years in prison for a car accident that I caused while I was drinking. I had no idea the challenges that I would face when I was released from prison that first time. Everything from housing to employment uh, was impacted. I spent the past 20 years trying to get past my record. The people in my life most affected by my record are my children. My wife. My kids are doing a life sentence with me because it affects me keeping a roof over their head. I can meet every criteria for a job, but you see that felony, it's over with. It's like uh, carrying weight around my neck. The weight, I'll probably carry this for the rest of my life. The first word that comes to mind is free. Free. Relief. Relief from the constant anxiety of someone finding out about me. I would say to people who are hesitant about passing any legislation, is that we're just like you. I clock in like everybody else. I pay my bills like everybody else. Why can't I be entitled to that second chance? Those of us that are convicted felons, we want to turn the page. What society would give by passing clean slate is a law-abiding citizen, a voter, a person that can give back to society. That's a win-win for everybody. People have possibilities. I don't care who they are. Everybody has something to give, but you don't know that until you give them a chance. We're not just a cell number. We're not just an inmate number. I am a mother. I am a manager and I am a leader. You know, I stand up for what I believe in. And I believe in clean slate. I'm standing up for it. So I need y'all to stand with me too. All right, and there is the uh, Clean Slate website there um, on the screen right now. So please check that out if you haven't already. Um, I'm gonna mention it a little bit later as well and with some ways to get involved. So why Clean Slate? Why is this important for us in Missouri? Well, um, almost 2 million people in Missouri have an arrest or a conviction record. And um, as you know, the hidden cost of a criminal record um, are very large. They impact a lot of different aspects of folks' lives, um, including you know, some of the main first areas that people think of, employment, housing, education, um, but also insidi insidiously in a lot of other ways, including like insurance rates and if you want to volunteer um, uh, with a place or um, go through the adoption process, um, all of these things can be impacted by someone's criminal record. These are the states that have already passed clean slate legislation. Um, so specifically, let's look at Oklahoma. They just, uh, they're the most recent state to pass clean slate. Um, and certainly a state that we think of as, you know, kind of also um, more of a red state or a conservative state like Missouri. Um, and same with Michigan and Utah. 
Um, so we have a lot of good groundwork that's been done throughout the country. Um, on the right side of this, you see states uh, that are currently working to pass clean slate laws, including us here in Missouri. Um, so there is a really big national push for clean slate. So what is clean slate? Clean slate is uh, automated expungement. So in Missouri right now, we have a petition-based process. There's a lot of barriers to record sealing in this process. Um, it's costly, time-consuming, and inaccessible. You'll hear more about it very shortly um, from Brittany Shaw. Um, so I won't get into the weeds too much, but just know that as of right now, only about 1% of folks that are actually eligible for expungement in Missouri are getting one. Um, and based on these current rates, it would take a thousand years to clear the expungement backlog. So we have some, you know, some pretty good um, expungement policy on the books in Missouri in terms of types of offenses. We also have a, a relatively short waiting period, um, but there's such a huge gap because the petition-based process is so inaccessible that even though we've got you know, some, some good stipulations in place to try to uh, bring record sealing to Missourians, it's just not happening um, at the levels um, that actually exist in terms of the folks that need it. So automation would ensure that anybody that qualifies for expungement is able to get that record sealed, regardless of if they can afford a lawyer and go through the whole um, expensive and time-consuming court process. Um, so it would make it much more equitable. We also know um, that about 95% of incarcerated individuals serve their sentences and come home. So Clean Slate is really about safety. We're really talking about making our communities safer by eliminating barriers that folks face when they come back home. Um, people are facing barriers in employment, housing, education, um, and this leads to higher rates of recidivism. Um, Clean Slate will remove those barriers and allow folks to support themselves and their families. Research shows that after five years of uh, benefiting from expungement, individuals were less likely than members of the general public to be convicted of a crime. So we are seeing, um, we are seeing that there's really powerful impacts of expungement. Clean Slate is about second chances. So it's about people being able to move on with their lives um, and not be held back by a criminal record. So individuals are 11% more likely to get a job after expungement and income for folks um, in the first year after expungement raises an average of 22%. So um, really measurable uh, positive outcomes that we're seeing, um, which means thriving families, safer communities and fewer taxpayer dollars um, that have to go to uh, benefits and such. Clean Slate is good for the economy. Um, we know that many businesses right now are struggling to find workers, but there's tens of thousands of qualified applicants um, that are being blocked from the job market because of criminal records. Um, and so expungement can help these folks build a better life while also strengthening local businesses and boosting the economy. This has been a really, um, a really kind of good talking point for Clean Slate um, in a lot of other states. This has been branded as like an economic issue. Um, and I think that is a powerful argument, although I think the most important thing is um, is lifting folks in Missouri um, out of poverty um, and out of the barriers that they are faced with because of a criminal record. Um, but benefits to the economy are a wonderful added bonus. Um, so these are just some ways to get involved um, in Clean Slate if you are interested in uh, being more involved in the campaign or just kind of being in the loop more generally. Um, we have an upcoming in-person town hall at the end of the month at Trinity Episcopal on Wednesday, uh, September 28th. Then we're also going to have in-person town halls throughout the state in Kansas City, Springfield, Cape Girardeau, Joplin, and Columbia. Um, stay tuned for more information as long as you're signed up for the Clean Slate newsletter. Um, you will get all of that information. You can send us event information if you're aware of um, a immune. Uh, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm looking and just having to respond to some emails of folks that need Zoom links. One second, I want to make sure that I get these. I think that what might have happened is that um, the Zoom link was like the reminder email was going to people's junk mail. So bear with me really quick.
Okay, great. Um, so you can send us your event information if you're aware of like a community event, a resource fair, um, something in your community, something that your organization is putting on, please let us know. We would love to get information out at those events about Clean Slate. Um, we also, Empower Missouri has our annual anti-poverty summit coming up um, in mid-November in Jefferson City, and there's going to be a Clean Slate track. So we're really going to be um, focusing heavily on Clean Slate um, and really doing some, some strategizing and, and information sharing um, about the policy specifics. By the time of the conference, we will know kind of exactly what is in our legislative proposal. Um, right now, I've kind of outlined the key points of Clean Slate, which is that it would um, automate the expungement process, but we don't know all of the specifics about what that will look like in Missouri yet. Um, one thing that we know it will include um, is an increase in the number of offenses. Um, the current cap is one felony and two misdemeanors. Um, I cannot say with certainty yet what our legislative language on that is going to be. Um, UMKC are policy partners and they are drafting that legislation right now. Um, but we have talked about raising it to three felonies and five misdemeanors. I believe that is what we are going to um, be trying for. Um, and then a lot of other changes, um, you know, we're kind of laying the groundwork with Clean Slate um, to continue to expand in future years. Pennsylvania, for example, was one of the first states, the first state to uh, pass Clean Slate legislation, and they are now on their third um, and actually maybe fourth iteration, um, each time kind of expanding how many people um, are able to access this lunchman. Other ways to get involved um, or to help our campaign spread the word, please forward our newsletter or other campaign materials to your networks, to people that you think might be interested in this um, or people that you think might <laughs> might be mad about it. We want them to, to be talking about it and, and be aware um, too. We wanna have that conversation with folks. So um, you can check out our campaign website. There's a lot of ways to get involved on the website. You can sign on to a support letter, um, sign up to be a volunteer um, or get involved in a working group or sign on to be an organizational partner um, of the Clean Slate campaign. The last thing that I'm gonna go through before yes, I turn it over to our speakers um, is kind of what an organizational campaign partner um, entails. Um, you would be listed on the Clean Slate campaign website, um, participate in our social media campaigns. So we would ask you to share information. Um, when we have uh, social media campaigns going on, share campaign volunteer opportunities, um, contribute letters of edit, letter, letters of support and op-eds, um, and providing feedback on draft versions of legislation and eventually submitting testimony in support of clean slate legislation. So if you're looking for a way for your organization to get involved at a higher level, um, we have a lot of our organizational campaign partners on this call. So thank you for coming today. Um, please let me know. We are really looking to expand our coalition. Um, so please get in touch with me if you'd like to be involved with that. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna stop screen sharing um, and turn it over to our amazing panelists. Um, and first to start off, I'm just gonna ask um, that you all kind of talk a little bit about your work and your organization um, and kind of what motivates you to, to do this work. Um, what, what brought you to uh, the work that you do? And I'm gonna start um, with Brittany. And Brittany, I know I had asked you also to kind of go um, more intensely into the current um, process, you can kind of hold off on that until the second round of questions and just talk a little bit more generally. All righty, hello everybody. My name is Brittany Shaw. I am a staff attorney and the expungement clinic coordinator at Arch City Defenders here in St. Louis City. Um, I've been with them a little over a year now. I interned with them when I was attending SLU Law and uh, it took two years, but I decided to make my way back. Um, honestly, what brought me into the work is just a desire to increase access to courts and counsel and justice generally for folks who need the, the help. Um, um, Gwen mentioned earlier how I, I ran my own firm for a little bit. I was in Chicago, I got hooked up with some people that made me get my own firm. So when COVID hit, I was by myself. And one of the biggest issues I had was charging people money. Um, there are so many people that need legal services that either A, don't know how to get it, 
or B, don't have the money to get it. So there were, you know, friends and family members and friends of friends and family of friends that needed like divorces or child support modifications or expungements or just something that there is a form for, but the process isn't quite clearly delineated. Um, and I was eager to hop on and help folks with that. Like I said, I don't like charging people money. So that's not sustainable for, you know, a business, let alone a person trying to make a, a meager living for themselves. So when I did get hooked up with Arch City, it gave me the opportunity to continue that mission and also get a salary at the same time to make it a little bit easier. Um, what I've been doing with our expungement program, it's called Restart. I have been training volunteer lawyers. Um, I've done a bunch of CLEs in the last year or so, um, just giving an overview on the changes in Missouri law with regard to expungement and uh, an overview on how to do the petition-based process, um, which I'll talk about later if Gwen wants me to. Um, I've already you know, done an expungement. It took me two months and 22 days, uh, which isn't, um, I won't say rare, but I mean, based on the way that the, the courts are set up, it doesn't always adhere to the time limits prescribed in the statute, which makes it harder for people to obtain expungements. Um, so I've, I've tried to make the program um, easy enough for attorneys to get in and help out, easy enough for applicants to find and contact us, and just easy enough to try to, you know, increase that access to expungement as the law continues to change. Um, I've also been working with UMKC on that proposed legislation. We have discussed increasing um, time limits or adding time limits instead of increasing the number of expungements you may get. Um, there was some proposed language in another Senate bill for just having unlimited expungements. But obviously, when you're preparing legislation, you have to find a middle ground um, that's not so extreme that people are going to vehemently reject it. And then you're not going to further advance the cause. Um, so I am excited to be working with the Clean Slate program and helping out and plugging in wherever I can. Um, and it's nice to see you all here um, ready to learn about the calls and hopefully help us out. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, Ms. Barb, could you uh, go next? And again, just kind of tell us who you are, what's your role um, in, in your organization's work. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Barbara Baker, Advocate Director and Peer Support Specialist for Keyway Center for Divergent and Reentry, formerly Center for Women in Transition. We've been around 25 years, and I have to correct you, uh, uh, Gwen, I've been with the organization 23 years. I just celebrated three, 23 years in August with the organization. So we work with women coming out of jails and prisons. I advocate in the jails for alternative over incarceration, asking the judge to put them in our program instead of keeping them locked up, as well as women coming out of the prison in Vandalia and Chillicothe. So a lot of our women that come to us have, some of them have little stuff and some of them have some family support and some of them have nothing but what they got on their back with no family support. So we try step in and try to make sure their basic needs are met the first day they walk out of jail to make sure they have a place to live. We have three houses we have the Barbara Baker house, we have the Sherman house, and we have our recovery home in the central West End called the Sharon house. So they can go from Sherman house to Baker house and to the Sharon house or either they can go live independent. We also have women that in the program that does live in our, uh, that live in, independently. So that's our community-based program. And they have a case manager that works with them as well. When the women come to us, they come to us, they don't have a job or anything. So uh, they come with nothing and they don't have to have a job to come for us. As a matter of fact, we recommend that they don't work for the first 30 days that they come to us because a lot of our women have a drug background. So we want to get them set up and evaluated to see if they need outpatient treatment and those kind of things and get them set up with the people that they're gonna be working with for a year while they're in the program. 
once they start working, they pay 30% of their fees for goes towards program fees and 30% goes into a saving and the other 40% they get to do whatever they want with everything is supplied for them, such as what uh, cleaning supplies, hygiene items, washing powder, detergent, all those things, bus passes. And if they're not eligible for uh, food stamps, then they get a food card twice a month. So uh, we do all those things to help them get themselves settled and be in a safe place to start working on change. And a lot of them, we have a lot of success, not 100% not success, but we have more success than we do failures. And uh, this clean slate and expungement and all that has always been close to my heart because I'm also a prior offender and um, then dealt with trying to get different jobs and stuff like that. As I watch the women that we work with, I watch how hard they work on change and work on saving their monies and stuff. And you'd be surprised with them little jobs and they don't have no bills to really pay. That little money really adds up. But when it's not enough for them to take care of themselves and maintain a house with lights and gas, it's just a necessity, you know, and try to raise their family. A lot of our women have dependent children and stuff. So uh, I was back many years ago, some of us on this call was working on that, remove the box, stop asking about if you got a felony conviction, but that didn't really do anything to remove the thing. So I'm just really interested in seeing the, this clean slate get passed and I'm willing to do whatever I can to help it get passed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barb. And it's so funny. I like, so I pulled your bio info off of the Keyway website and I thought I was like, she's been there longer than 18 years, right? So yes. <laughs> I <to> update that. <laughs> I, got, I got one foot in the door and one out the door. I hope my ED don't hear me say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have a big party for you when you're ready to retire because right. you, you deserve to, to retire whenever you want to. That's for sure. You've done so much work. All right. Thank All right. you. Okay, Jamie, Thank same you. question. Hello, I am Jamie Martin. I am um, with the Missouri Coalition of Recovery Support Providers. Um, I'm the Director of Training and Technical Support. I have um, pretty much devoted my entire adult existence to um, trying to find a way out of um, being um, banned from colleges, jobs, um, due to my history, I have um, not an extensive but very brief and very serious uh, felonies for um, for drugs. And there, um, I would have never ever committed a crime um, if it wasn't for having an addiction. So this is a very very soft um, topic for me. Like just listening to the video, um, Gwen, in the beginning of those stories um, with Dan. You know, Dan Hannikin was my first reentry. Uh, specialist. Um, and uh, just seeing him, we work together, you know, daily, we were just together today, you know, I, the man is amazing. And I just want to um, carry on and do whatever I can. Recently, I took on this position at the Missouri Coalition of Recovery Support Providers. And if you guys don't know who that or what that is, um, it's our state coalition and our mission. Um, and forgive me for not having it memorized yet. Um, our mission is we are a network of faith based peer and community organizations that restore and rebuild lives and families seeking recovery from substance use disorders through immediate access and long-term relationships and um i don't know about you guys but that completely speaks to my heart um because that's my life mission um also our vision to build building a unified voice uh, for missouri recovery support providers and so what i've been doing for the last um 13 years of my life um is being completely involved and enmeshed in um rebuilding my the community that i stole from and um, I literally donate all the time that I have. I've been in paid positions, yes, but when I'm not being paid to do this, I do it for free. I absolutely loved what Brittany shared. When your heart is in it, you're in it. I mean, this is it. This is life. This is this is what I do. And it just 
gave me chills. I mean, you guys, Barb, you guys are giving your lives, um, you know, and it's not about the paycheck. You know, it's just a, it's a great thing, like an after set of it. Right. But I would be doing it anyway for free. So um, anyway, so I really feel like um, I really feel like this clean slate thing is a huge deal. Um, I don't feel like one felony is enough. Um, I know for me, um, I, you know, had a very brief criminal history from 2003 to 2007. Um, and I um, was given six felonies in one arrest. And I never, <laughs> I was with people that had drugs. You know what I mean? Like the, the it does not even make sense um, what our police department was up to that day. It doesn't even make sense. Um, uh, my parents always said, you know, they're, their uh, 48th wedding anniversary was yesterday. They've been together since high school and they're amazing parents. And um, my brother and I are the only two people in our family that struggle with addiction. And um, we've both been clean for 13 years. So needless to say, 2009 was a really, really good year for my parents. But I will say that if it wasn't for uh, the reentry programs, the housing, um, the housing situation, you know, like, um, the reentry specialists, the programs, and the people who believed in us, um, we wouldn't be here to tell the story today, you know, that it is possible. I would love, love, love to see um, everyone have an opportunity. Um, a little bit more on a personal level, um, 12 years ago, um, after I'd had some clean time, I tried to get into Columbia College, and um, they sent me a letter and told me, that I would no longer be able to finish the college degree that I started because of my history, um, that they were sorry, but they weren't gonna accept me to their program. Um, I had originally been um, involved in the psychology department there and uh, got really good grades, uh, but because of my felony convictions, I wasn't able to go back to college there. Um, I did move to Jefferson City and studied my bachelor's degree in social work at Lincoln University. Uh, which was a wonderful school, amazing teachers, amazing classmates. I absolutely thrived there. And um, I have three children. So I had to do the um, the raise your kids on your own single mom thing and go to college. Um, and with the with the background that I had, I could not get a job. I was unemployable at McDonald's, uh, Walmart, gas stations, cashier positions. I mean, just I could bore you all day with the no's, but we all know uh, the answer was no. I started cleaning houses to pay for my way to keep my kids alive and well. I got food stamps. Um, I did everything I could to keep afloat. Um, and I just, I just kept going. I just kept going to school. So with that being said, um, it's about time. It's about time that we do something because I am not my disease and I am not my criminal history and I'm not my criminal past. I did things that I don't approve of that I would never, ever, ever want my children to know about um, in order to um, survive and get through just another day. Um, and I am just all in. I'm all in with trying to help people to become productive members of the society. You know, it's about time. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you all um, just for being here today and for sharing your stories and, and why this work matters to you. Um, I, I think it's very clear that, you know, you guys are not, um, you're, you're doing this work because it's extremely important because it's very close to, to your heart and who you are. And I'm just grateful to, to get to be working with you on Clean Slate and, and get to be learning from you today. So um, next question is for Brittany. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the current barriers that folks face with the petition-based expungement process and kind of just walk us through what that process looks like for, um, for somebody that you might be working with? Sure. Um, so the first thing to do to get an expungement would be to petition the court for the expungement. And one of the biggest barriers for even attorneys, let alone lay people, is getting access to complete records, um, all of the information that you need to put on that petition in order for them to even 
um, look into the case and make sure it exists and then to make sure there's no um, no roadblocks to as far as eligibility. So I know when I first started taking applications, um, I initially tried running people with their date of birth and name and social through the Highway Patrol website because I was told that they would have all the records um, regardless of what county it was. Well, we got a lot of people. We had about 17 people out of 30 that came back with no record. But on their application, they had indicated that they had a record, they had the specific charge, they had the location and the dates, but it wasn't coming through on the Highway Patrol's database. Well, in those cases, some records are considered open and some records are considered closed. And so I had to go find out which records are open and which records are closed. That's not something that, you know, a lay person would ordinarily consider and it's not something people really have time to go do. I have time to do it because it's my job. Um, some of these people received SIS, this suspended imposition of sentence, um, where it dropped off their record, but it drops off your, your public record. So using the name, date of birth and social, I was still considered a public requester. And if those records are closed, you can't see them. Um, so what I had to do is have some folks go get fingerprinted and request their own records on their own behalf. And that gave me access to all open and closed records. There are ways to do that here in the city and the county. You can also go to the police station and request those records. Um, but if you're a third party trying to request those records on someone's behalf, you have to go get a notarized statement. You have to fill out a form, you have to submit it and then request them and then wait for those records to come to you. Um, so record keeping and obtaining records has been a big roadblock. Um, when I first did the first highway patrol search to do it, it was 14 bucks. To do fingerprints through the highway patrol, it's 28 bucks. It is cheaper to go to the police station, but then you run into those issues about having to do the notarized letter. And also the county says, if you have records in the county and the city, we can pull them for you. But if you only have records in the city, we can't look those up here, which doesn't make sense because they can look them up if you have a county record, but not a city. It's, it's weird. It doesn't make sense. So it's a roadblock for a lot of people that are just trying to get it done and get the information so that they could put it on their petition. Um, the petition itself is pretty straightforward. I noticed one big thing that a lot of people have told me they've had issues with is who do they name as respondents? So the statute says you must name all people that might have um, knowledge of the records or might have the records in their possession. Otherwise, if you do get an order of expungement, if those people weren't named, they don't have notice. So they won't get rid of your record. And then it seems like everything that you've done is kind of futile because there's still somebody that has knowledge of that record. Um, so a lot of people will name the police station and maybe the highway patrol and that's it. Well, you have to name the highway patrol. You have to name the prosecuting attorney, whether it was municipal or not. You have to name the court. Um, you have to name the arresting agency. Anybody else that you think might have those records, you have to name them or else it's not going to apply to them. And so a lot of people get things kicked back or delayed because they didn't give proper notice to all the parties they wanted to notice up. The biggest thing is paying for the petition. Um, there is a form called Informa Papyrus, um, which I think translates to proceed as a, a poor person, which sounds bad, but you fill it out. You know, it's a financial statement of your monthly income, your debts and your assets, just a brief snapshot. And then the court takes that into consideration into whether you can pay the expungement fees. Right now they are obnoxiously high um, in St. Louis, city with all of those entities named it cost me $503 to file a petition for expungement for my client whose IFP was denied she didn't make a lot of money she's working at Walmart as a cashier and they said well she's got enough money to live so if she can't afford an expungement right now maybe she sh should save up and come back which shouldn't be an issue um I couldn't even afford an expungement right now if I needed one uh, and I'm an attorney um, so that's how much it is there. It's always the base price plus service. 
So uh, the base price is whatever that city or county charges, plus a $250 surcharge, which is authorized by state statute. It says in all cases for expungement, except for mistaken or stolen identity, there shall be a $250 surcharge. Um, and then you have to pay a certain amount for the service of each party named in your petition. So if you got four people named, that's $35 times four people, in addition to the 250, in addition to the base filing fee. So it's really expensive. Um, and there are a lot of people that see the, the total, the price, they get discouraged. A lot of people that hear about people that tried to file in former pauperous petitions and got denied. Um, out of the three that I filed, only one got accepted. And uh, I went to sit down and speak with a judge regarding the criteria that they use to uh, make those determinations. And a judge actually told me that if the numbers on the uh, form don't match up, so if they say they don't have a lot of income um, or they have a lot of debt, but they come into court looking fairly nice, they're gonna deny the petition. And I had to tell that judge, I said, you can get designer clothes from Goodwill or Ross. You, you can get you know a bunch of nice looking stuff from all these places for a low price or donate it to you. And just because you look nice doesn't mean that you have money. That judge actually commented on the outfit I was wearing. And she said, well, I expect that of you because you're an attorney. Guess what, homegirl, I shop at Ross. So... <laughs> It's like you cannot judge people by how they look. Um, another specific thing she mentioned was if they bring kids to court and the kids are wearing Jordans. And I had to tell her there are some parents that will spend their last dime getting their kids nicer clothes than they can afford and nicer clothes than they buy themselves, especially in minority families because of how children are in school and how children's you know, self-esteem, how fragile it is. I mean, I used to be mad at my mom for shopping at Walmart and Kohl's and stuff, and everybody else was wearing different things in private school, like American Eagle and all of that. And my mom, you know, would try to find one American Eagle shirt so I could fit in, you know, even if it was a substantial amount of money that she didn't budget to spend on clothing for that month. Um, so I, I would hope that the conversation helped that judge's, you know, decision making process in the future but that's just one judge out of many um, across the state of Missouri. So some of the big, biggest barriers are records, um, poor record keeping, poor ways of obtaining those records, um, high filing fees, and the, the really the, the lack of um, objectivity with regard to informer papyrus um, applications. Another thing is I mentioned early on the SISs, there is no current legal mechanism to get rid of an SIS. So it doesn't drop off your record, it raises the security level. So while you might not be able to see it if you search it on CaseNet as a regular person, if you were to um, you know, do a federal background check or something else where you had a little bit more access to the records, if you were law enforcement, if you were the court, you can still get access to that record. And there is no way to get rid of an SIS. For the um, expungement statute regarding arrest, it specifically says you can't do SIS. For the expungement statute regarding convictions, which is the most broad and the one that people can actually petition the most under, it says only for convictions. And SIS is not a conviction. Um, so there are a lot of people that are applying for jobs, and even though an SIS is a fairly like low rate punishment, people don't care about you know the the slap on the wrist or regardless of what low rate punishment they get, they see that you were charged with a crime and that you received the punishment, and they don't ask any further questions beyond that. So even SISs they stop people from getting jobs and getting housing, better housing. A landlord looks up and sees that you have a, a criminal case. They don't care what it was for. You got a criminal case, next applicant. Um, so the expungement process is, while there, there is a lot of room for growth, um, there's a lot of eligible offenses that weren't previously eligible and it does make it easier it's still not easy and it's still not accessible 
And even if people, you know, did look past the filing fees or did look past the issues with record keeping, it's very time consuming if you don't have the time to dedicate to it. And if this wasn't my job, if I was the one that was trying to get the record expunged so that I can get a better job, I'm working. You know, it's not like I have a lucrative job where I can just take off and go off and do my, my, my court filings. You're working all the time and there's really no chance for you to do that. Um, with regard to access to counsel, there are still people that charge three, four, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars for expungements. And even though there are organizations like Arch City that do those for free and cover the expenses, if we can't, you know, get the, the fees, fee waivers, we are, we only have so much capacity. Um, right now, I am the only in-house attorney doing the vast majority of our applicants. I did start dishing them out to my coworkers, but only as they train. When we have 17 million other things to do in our organization, since we are a holistic organization, it's very hard to squeeze in a training here and there and thereafter take on more cases. I believe I have 86 cases on my caseload right now, and I have like a good 10 expungements that I, that I can file, you know, at any time. It's just a matter of, you know, timing. And so my goal has to be to train as many volunteers as possible and be able to dish those out as they come in but that's just St. Louis City and St. Louis County. That's not the state. Um, as Gwen mentioned, less than 1% of people that are eligible will actually get an expungement. Um, so my focus has just been able to, to try to maximize what I can do in this community as long as I'm here. And in working with UMKC and Clean Slate and helping draft the legislation and propose ideas on how to make it better after, you know, being in the field and actually filing these cases and talking to these clients. Um, I mean, I think it's very beneficial. I think all the community support, all the organizations we have, there are a lot of people in the community that have knowledge and that their goal is to advocate for, you know, the people that seek advocacy from them. And I think, you know, as we keep doing it and coming together and working things out, we'll get where we might not get where we need to be or where we want to be in like a utopian society, but we'll get closer each time that we do things like this. So I'm very happy to be working um, with you all. And anybody has questions on the process, um, then, you know, you can always reach out to me. I can put my email in the chat. I had some folks that they tried to email and it didn't come through. Just, you know, if you don't hear from me, I'll put my work cell phone in there too. And eventually, you know, I'll try to get back. Um, but any help and assistance that you all can provide as community organizations and activists and organizers and all of that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brittany. That was extremely informative and also like extremely infuriating <laughs> just hearing, hearing you walk through um, how complicated that process is, um, how difficult it is for folks to access um, what they are already entitled to um, in Missouri law. So thank you for walking us through that. Um, really appreciate it. Um, next question, everybody's kind of been touching on this, so I, you know, we, we don't have to spend much time on it, but um, in case anybody has something to say that hasn't already been said, um, Barb, maybe you can start us off. Um, what are those hidden impacts of having a criminal record? Um, we've talked about some of the big ones. Um, and Jamie, specifically in your story, you talked um, about some barriers that you faced. Um, Barb, is there anything anything that you'd add from, um, from your experiences or your time with uh, working with women at Keyway? Not, not a lot that, you know, not only do it uh, prevent people from getting jobs, housing, credit, and all of those things. So. It's, it's just a very big uh, mishap when we expect people to come out and and be successful in society, but we cut them off from a lot of different things. So I don't have a lot more to add to what she said, but I agree with everything she said. Jamie, do you have anything else to add about what you see your clients experience with, with those criminal convictions, criminal record? I have seen 
recently more than anything um is um the like the hud housing the voucher program the um you know public housing like the um you know to keep people from having to live in an unhoused community uh tent living stuff like that uh, there is like so much money and so much resource but um there's still the barrier the barrier right now um of uh getting food stamps. So um, I have a very close person uh, to me that um, just had a child and um, she had a drug, one drug felony conviction. Um, within the last three years, because it, they, they, I guess, had it, but they didn't file it until a year later. So I guess she actually offended four years ago or whatever, but um, she was charged with the crime pled guilty to it, did her time, got out, devoted her life to um, her new relationship with a very healthy business owner doing what she needed to do. It didn't work out. She got pregnant. She is now has a one-year-old and cannot, even through um, filling out the paperwork and doing the appeals process and everything, she cannot get food stamps uh, to feed herself and she can't afford daycare because she has felonies. She can't get a job. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Um, I helped her um, to start cleaning houses too. You know, that's what I had to do. I had to go to these women and say, hey, you've got a great job and I would love to clean your house. You know, what do you think? I've got kids to take care of. I've got bills to pay. Do you think I could clean your house? And they told their friends and their friends' friends. And I've had a successful cleaning business for 13 years, but I'm saying that's not how most people are built. We got to feed our families. How are you going to stay out of jail um, if you can't feed your family? You have to get food. And that's huge. Absolutely. Yeah, the lack of access to benefits um, is a huge one. And, and that's yeah, something that continues, um, even though there's been, you know, policies to try to expand access to SNAP for folks um, with drug felonies. Uh, Barb and I were on a call just earlier today, kind of doing some uh, strategizing around legislative changes um, to the SNAP policy. And, and I think, you know, it's important to note that there's a lot of policy changes that need to happen to make um, to lessen the impact of a criminal record. But until we get to that point in society where having a criminal record isn't this big of a barrier, I think that that automatic expungement um, is the best path forward um, because all of those other policies and the societal changes that need to take place for people to not um, always have that criminal record hanging over them, um, unfortunately, I think are just too slow and too far away um, and automatic expungement as a way to kind of um, bring us there a lot faster. So in that vein, um, this is the last question I'll put to the panelists before we open it up for questions. Um, but just how do you think clean slate legislation, if, if we are able to pass this in Missouri um, and if we get automatic expungement on the books in Missouri, how do you think this would impact the lives of the people that you work with and whoever can start us off? I think I think the women at Keyway would impact their lives uh, for the better. You know, like I say, they're working hard on change and stuff. So they need to have that second chance where they can get a, a decent job. And sometimes the criminal record is not even based around the job and stuff. So uh, I just think it'll be a great impact for them. And I also want to add, even with some of them with those uh, Section 8 vouchers and stuff, get turned down for housing because of their record. Because I had that to happen to a lady. She was approved for the Section 8, but one of the houses she tried to get, they denied her because she had a DWI on her record. So I think that that'll help people tremendously pause where, where they'd be able to live in nice places and nice school districts to bring up their children and stuff. But it, it's just a great benefit for them. That's all I have. I think one of the biggest ways that it would help with um, my clients and everybody seeking to get an expungement is that it would make the process easier by not having them go through the process. Um, you know, there are a lot of low level offenses, whether it's shoplifting or 
uh, cash in a bad check or marijuana possession. There are a lot of things that should not stop a person from, you know, being a person um, and being able to make a living as a, a whole person. And so the, the automated process um, would allow them not to take away from that time that they need to do other things to progress, um, to go fight, you know, a case that they've already fought and been sentenced for. Um, a record shouldn't be a life sentence. And so automating that would give them the ability to go, you know, do what they need to do. And then also, you know, take care of that on the back end. Um, and they won't have to search for a lawyer or search for a pro bono organization or pay for fingerprints, you know, two times or get these records or get those. And, you know, all the stuff that is involved with the, the current process. Um, I think the clean, clean slate legislation would take care of a vast majority um, of those issues that people have with regard to wanting to do an expungement, but not really having the means to do it. Definitely. Jamie, do you have anything to add? I just was thinking when she was speaking about adoption and foster care, do you know how many amazing people who've uh, written a bad check would be amazing foster parents? You know, and we have a shortage. We have, we need people. We need warm, loving people to be caregivers for these children. These, you know, these children need a place to go. And there's, you know, that would be great. But it stopped. It stops right there. Yeah, the impacts are so far reaching. I think, you know, it, it's hard to really even get your head around it sometimes. So um, I think that Clean Slate, likewise, the positive impacts of Clean Slate, we, you know, can imagine, but we we don't even see the full picture yet um, of, of what Clean Slate could really do in our state. So thank you all so much um, for sharing your perspectives and experiences.